All right, I think we're live and we're about to hit this thing heavy. Stay tuned, I created this intro especially for you. Despite growing up with a picture of Noah's Ark on my bedroom wall, I would go 25 years of my life without ever studying the story's historicity. That was until one particular day when my dad recommended that for my next public talk, I take a look at the outline, The Flood of Noah's Day Has Meaning for Us. In 2018, as a ministerial servant, I would stand on the platform and try my utmost in public talks to convince the audience that the God Jehovah existed. Six months ago, I was in the kitchen preparing dinner when I overheard the voice of one of the elders in my congregation on the Zoom meeting. He said, you are under attack. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a heavy show, especially for the ex-Jehovah's Jehovah, Witness community, but for those of us who've found our way out of the cult of Christianity, not just the cult of the Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I have a really, really interesting guest joining us today, as you saw in the thumbnail, and most of you probably know, Harrison Cother will be joining me, and we're going to be talking about three things that debunk Christianity. All right. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, Derek. Lovely to be here. I'll tell you what, that was an intro. Look, man, I put that together especially for you and, of course, everyone out there that's watching. You popped up out of nowhere um, with your YouTube channel, being an apostate, how long ago did you leave? So technically disassociated in September last year, September 2020. But that whole process of waking up and then fading and then finally being able to relinquish those chains on my life is a process that took at least two, maybe three years. Wow. Okay. So we're going to be talking about three heavy things today. I don't want everyone to be cliffhanging, you know, waiting too long, but I do want to ask everyone go in the description, check out his YouTube channel, subscribe to his channel. He spends a lot of time developing his content and a lot of research goes into it. One of my favorites that you do was the flood. Uh, you oh, yeah. really went deep and we're going to discuss some of that today. So if you don't know who he is, please go support him, join his stuff and let me ask you this, as we lead into these three things, Harrison, what led you to really want to question? I think it's important to give people what happened. You were in the box and now you're actually examining it. So take us there, brother. Okay. Well, I suppose from a young age, I've always been fascinated by a topic of, of dinosaurs and carnivores. And I know we're going to go into discussing that. When mentally you get in the stage of your life when you want to start addressing these questions. That was the first thing I addressed. And then I went into Noah's Ark, the God of the Old Testament. And I'm so excited to delve into these three topics in more detail with you, Derek. But the problem, which we obviously know about coming from a Christian background, is the fact that many people can go their entire lives without ever opening that box of doubts and opening and just, just pulling out one question. For many people, they'll have a, a very high level of cognitive dissonance which means that they might feel like something is wrong. They might have a doubt or a question, but because of so many different factors, their family, their faith, uh, personal experiences of God, the universe, all these topics which they have built into this tower of their religious belief system, they may never get around to questioning it. Mm. But I think for me, 
uh, when I moved congregations from one Jehovah's Witness hall to another and I wasn't recommended as a ministerial servant, it allowed me the time, the space to be able to delve into that box and to open the lid and to pull out some of these doubts and finally address them. And you you didn't just address them. I'm sure you get criticism. You hit them head on. Uh, you really, really made a lot of sense to a lot of people and you've stirred up some controversy in the community. So one thing I really appreciate you is you're very articulate. Uh, you say things and you mean them and you're very clear on what you're trying to do. And that is to educate the general public and to try and now that your eyes have been so, so to speak, opened, let people see the truth of what's going on with these myths and these stories. And some of it might have history to it, but uh, the way it's been packaged to you and me has what I think caused damage to so many people for sure. So uh, let's go ahead. We're going to go into one here, but real quick, Tony Morris. Thank you so much. My friend Harrison is very thorough in his research. It will be a nice show today. Congrats guys. Really appreciate the super chats. Um, I'll try to get to them. We're going to go to the three points and we will be taking your questions. So if you want to super chat your question, please feel free to the colors pop in my eyes and then I'm able to see it. So if you super chat, I'll jump to your question and we can go from there. What's the first thing you would say that really, really damaged your shield of faith, so to speak? The first topic we need to go into, absolutely must, is dinosaurs and carnivores. I think Cosmic Skeptic, who many people will know, recently did a video on his channel about the number one problem for Christianity today. And I couldn't agree with him more. In fact, my video was before his, so I'm going to kind of take the credit on that one. Um, the first thing I did was dinosaurs and carnivores, because what's quite unique to the Jehovah's Witness belief system, rather than the whole of Christianity, is this view of creation. So the Genesis days aren't literal days, they're epochs of time, so they could be hundreds of millions of years. So they don't have a problem with the fact that dinosaurs could have been two, three hundred millions year of years old. Mm -hmm. What they do have a problem with is this idea that they were created to be carnivores. So according to their belief system, before Satan's rebellion and Adam and Eve's rebellion in the Garden of Eden, they would have been herbivorous. And then in the new system after Armageddon, they will again be herbivorous. Hmm. So if either you can debunk the past life on earth as proving it to be carnivorous or the future life and present life as being designed to be carnivorous, you have essentially wiped out the entire belief system. Wow. Yeah. And so I think for me, growing up watching TV programs with my dad, nature documentaries and things like it's it's absolutely horrific, isn't it? Nature can be cruel. It can be barbaric. You know, you're watching a pack of wild hyenas disembowel a uh, impala or a, a gazelle alive, and the and the gazelle's crying out in pain, and it it's so horrific. And so my dad would look at this and he would say, "Satan's system." But is it Satan's system? That's the question. Or is there a god behind it who created it? Or did these animals evolve? And so what I did was I went to museums such as the Natural History Museum in London and I found three fossils which all showed evidence of carnivorous behaviour before 6,000 years ago. You know, a T-Rex tooth crown found lodged in an animal's spine, um, a velociraptor trapped with a protoceratops in battle and then, and then a sand dune collapsed on them. Uh, so you have these things which can't be explained and the elders do not want to go into that territory. They're just happy to, to float speculation and ideas and say, eventually we'll have answers. God will give us answers in due time. But that was nowhere near good enough for me at that, that time. Okay, I want to comment on that. Uh, Natalie Sanchez, thank you for the super chat, my friend. I really appreciate it. She says, keep uh, keep the hits coming. Love Harrison plus Derek. Thank you so much. That That is quite interesting. So you're saying if, according to the Jehovah's Witness idea, uh, if there was an animal eating another animal, carnivorous, uh, before 6,000 years ago, we have a problem. And the whole system of the Jehovah's Witness cosmology doesn't work. Yeah, so just discussing the T-Rex tooth crown and things like that, uh, my dad sent me a lot of research on how research has shown that the T-Rex was a scavenger and not hunter. So Jehovah may have used it to clean up other animals, to, you know, all these sorts of wacky mental gymnastics that you have to believe to keep yourself mentally compatible with the belief system of your religion that you've been right. indoctrinate, indoctrinated into. And so 
I mean, it, it takes an incredible mind once you come to learn about these these beings to be able to look at the the claws or the teeth of a T Rex and say this was not a hunter. You know, if, if it was a scavenger, what's it going to do if it's not found a dead body in a hundred miles? Just let a little weak herbivore walk by without eating it. It's ludicrous. That's interesting. So you mentioned dinosaurs, but the animal kingdom as cosmic skeptic brings up and he does like, he really like sits there and wants to focus on this problem. They, according to the Christian worldview or most Christians that I'm aware of, they say, you know, because Adam ate from that tree and so did Eve, animals are now taking the guilt. They are getting repercussions for this. They're now, if you will, death enters the world. Death wasn't there before. Now, I know some Christians that want to go, you know, death was there in the animal kingdom before, but not in the human kingdom. And so they want to differentiate. But it sounds like all creation, uh, if you take this approach, is taking a hit especially since you want to go into Genesis one, it's cosmological. Uh, it's speaking of animals in the sky and on the creep of things on the earth and, and water animals and, or if you will, water creatures and then humans. So there's this serious situation where when man hits that falls, if you will, all creation gets corrupt. And I think that's pretty bad. I mean, they they're guilty. It's kind of the same idea of saying the children of the children of the children are also carrying the guilt of one man's mistake a long time ago. Either way, it's bad. If animals mm -hmm. get guilt, if humans who really were born into this get the guilt, it's kind of silly in my opinion. But can you elaborate on that topic there a little? Well, I, I think I get kind of the line you're going down. I think it, bringing it more into the present day since that rebellion in the Garden of Eden, according to the Jehovah's Witness theology, they will believe that cats, crocodiles, Every, every creature we really see today on the planet, whatever carnivore that may be, in the new system, they will be at peace with each other. Hmm. So if you find an animal today that is a obligate carnivore, which means that it must eat meat in order to survive, such as a cat, you then have to question, well, this cat, its metabolism, its, its kidneys, its intestinal tracts, its teeth, its claws, it looks like it's been perfectly designed to be a hunting, killing machine. How is Jehovah gonna take that, put it into a Garden of Eden and expect it to be your pet? You know, a big pet lion, a crocodile that you can sit on and go in the pool with like an inflatable one and, it, and not fear being attacked by it. You would have to completely change these animals. He would have to take it literally back to his design studio, change every single feature of a cat and to us, it would be unrecognizable as a cat. So in terms of the Jehovah's Witness theology and belief system on the topic of animals, I had thoroughly debunked it. And once I did that, it was kind of like opening the opening the box even further and you just reach in and grab more because now you start to not trust different things that the organization's telling you. Right. You know, it makes me think, and just on this topic, before we jump off of this particular point you make, and this is a very important one, is if animals are instinctually and naturally the way they are, like you described the cat here, the cat's not out there eating grass. It's not, you know, living off nuts that fall out of a tree. Uh, car it's carnivorous. And in its nature, it's that way. Then it makes you kind of wonder, what about humans? How should humans be? What is our nature? And is it a fall that actually causes all this or is there a better natural explanation when we look to things like science, evolution and other such um, paradigms that we can really explore, not the superstitions that we've been told by our ancestors? Don't get me wrong. That may be primitive science. And I like to say that because the ancients best way of it, understanding maybe, or at least in that culture, their understanding of how we got here. Why are we here? Why do we die? Okay, it makes sense. Why do we die? Uh, that would be a good, in their world, uh, something that they would understand. But now that we understand more, why are we holding on to something, clenching onto something from those times, if you will? And uh, I, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was no, just going to say that the yeah, humans fit into that thing as well, the category. 100%. Yeah, no, I completely agree. When you take any individual, especially on something like an island, take Australia, take Madagascar, these islands have 80, 90% of their flora and fauna, animals and, and trees and things like that, are endemic to that particular island. 
So this either means that God created the island of Madagascar completely as its own little paradise with its own ecosystem, or far more rationally, this has been separated from the mainland for tens of millions of years and has gradually evolved into fo- into forming its own animal ecosystem, its own trees, its own species in these regards. And then when you put those pieces together, you look into, into Australia, um, at Papua New Guinea, places like this, and you find, um, oh, what's the animal? The Tasmanian devil, the, ta- the Tasmanian tiger, which went extinct. These are species, predators, which only exist in that area and are closely related through their DNA to others from about 10, 20, 30, 40 million years. It all fits together perfectly from a more naturalistic evolutionary viewpoint. This is a final thing I'll say on this particular topic, and we'll move to a a second reason uh, to debunk this uh, Christianity, if you will. And it's not just Christianity. Abrahamic religions fall into this category, but ultimately our own, we like to jab at, is our Christian versions that we were part of. The human, the way we are as humans, our nature and how we are, we like to give, uh, I guess, as morals have evolved in society, we like to give uh, credit to the bad guy, the devil, for why we act a certain way. And the good guy, when we do good, uh, is God. And then there's the evil one, the devil. I think that all of this, if we look at how they view animals and what happened to animals and such in the Jehovah's Witness view, why are humans like this? In a natural sense, they never really consider that. So they have these walls up, like if you look at a woman in lust. I'm sorry, but if you look at the animal kingdom and understand why a a male might be attracted to a female of whatever species it might be, you're going to like give guilt and shame for its inherent natural want and desire that is built into its structure. It's a, it's kind of a silly uh, proposition to even say once you know about the animal kingdom or even the human kingdom and vice versa so i I think this this whole notion that sin and stuff like that this death is passed on also to the offspring of each of these species that's just as bad as well i mean now you're going to blame 500 generations in the future possibly get cooked forever in an afterlife depending on your paradigm which jehovah's witnesses don't take that approach Hmm. um i think it's annihilation but yeah yeah, but either way, you're guilty. You were born into this. I don't know what kind of God would do such a thing. It's all absurd. I mean, you're talking about, I've spoken to people quite recently who get in touch with me and these feelings of guilt they have uh, from their Christian upbringing and things like that, whether they be um, you know, heterosexual or, or homosexual or bisexual, whatever it is, they feel these sense of guilt, this overwhelming sort of cloud above their head, which has been put on them by their religion, when really they're a primate. This is what you should be doing. These are your um, kind of fleshly tendencies. And the difference is that with our intellectual capacity as homo sapiens, we have this ability to kind of think on a more rational, more more intelligent basis than these other primates. So we can often control our desires better and we can think, well, what's going to work out for me better in the long run? Being loyal to my one partner or going off with 10? And then where's that going to lead me eventually? So we can think on a far greater level. But what religion has done and cults have done, taking captive all these fleshly desires and harnessing it and only using it through the power of their religion, it's very intelligent. It is. It is clever. It is very clever. And I, I'm so glad you brought this up and just bringing this to our attention. I almost thought you were going to say, <laughs> I thought you were going to say, these are our God-given gifts that we naturally <laughs> have. <laughs> and it's just a really funny thing because it's amazing. It brings me right to Romans nine, where Paul is trying to explain and get God off the hook, why all these bad things happen. But uh, how can he blame us uh, when he's the one doing these things? And uh, and he says, "Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will the thing form say to its maker, Why have you made me thus? Or does not the potter have the right over the clay?" And so it's like, well, if we're pot, you know, if you take the idea that we're clay um, in the potter's hands. He made me this way, and now he's going to blame me? That's the absurdity of the theology in Paul and, of course, Christianity. So thank you for that, number one. Let's get to number two. Okay, I think number two, as you brought up morality a little while ago, and we're talking about topics to do with morality, it only makes sense to say that when I was going out on the ministry as a Jehovah's Witness, I would use three lines of evidence to bring people's attention to the fact that it would make more sense than less sense to say that there is a creator. 
a creator who sets the standards for what's right and wrong. And that's why me and you both, Derek, would say it is, is wrong to rape someone. It is wrong to murder a child. It's wrong to do this, this and this. We could form a list of stuff that we could agree with. And that probably 99% of the population would agree with is wrong. And so that was a clear line of evidence that I would use to show objective morality is true. I would use the teleological argument, the cosmological argument and the moral argument. But I always favoured the moral argument because it was so obvious, this innate sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. But that was until, I suppose, I considered more in depth the God of the Old Testament. Once I looked at dinosaurs and carnivores, as I said, you're then analysing the Bible through a different lens. You're not looking at it and saying, oh, this is true. There must have been a good reason God did this. You're then looking at this and saying, you know what? I can question God. Before, I, I'd never have questioned God. That would have been a blasphemous thing to do. But now, this being might not even exist. Let me take him on head to head. And you find countless examples in the Old Testament of instances where you're then thinking, God, I wouldn't have done that. If I behaved like this guy in the Old Testament, I'd be in prison or I'd have been executed by law. You know, I did want to read to you a quote here from The God Delusion. Please do. Uh, maybe some of your viewers might have, have read this quote. Others may not have. So this will be you know, fascinating. And this is a quote from Richard Dawkins, which sparked a lot of controversy and it got a lot of Christians on his back. He describes the God of the Old Testament as the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Now you can imagine to my Christian brain when I sat in bed and read The God Delusion, <laughs> and I, I was kind of, I wanted to give the other side of the argument a chance because I was still predominantly a Christian thinker trying to defend these beliefs in a style of ap apologetics. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take what he says and I'm going to really question it. I agreed with a couple of things he said from his perspective, but I took about five or six and I was like, that's not true. That's right. not true. That can't be true. But the more research I did, the more biblical accounts I read with this open mind, the more I was like, you know what? Richard Dawkins is a genius. <laughs> he just states it how it is. Yeah. I want to say uh, real quick in light of this vein, and we're going to dig into this a little here. Uh, so one person wants us to convert to Islam. God is just, he has to punish yeah, I, I'd stay tuned a little longer because the God of the Bible, hmm, not sure how just this is. You're going to see that. As well, if he's goes. a part of if he's a part of um, Islam or Muslim or, or whatever his religious belief may be, he probably relies on the Pentateuch too. So we'll be going into Noah's Ark. So stay tuned. Yeah, and of course they have different slants of their own narrative per pertaining to the Genesis uh, creation and uh, getting into the Abraham story and such. I suspect there's a flood narrative somewhere, uh, but there's like a presupposition. And the presupposition is God can do what he wants. And either way, he's still just and righteous and good. And it's like, no, pay attention and just try and consider where we're coming from if you're a believer. Also, Freddie Ray, uh, thank you for the super chat, my friend. JWs are always very concerned about what others think of them and how they are viewed. How have you been able to deal with that? Basically saying F it? Good question. I think people in my family, I'm not going to mention names, Growing up, they had an overwhelming concern about how other people viewed them. And that's naturally your tendency because you're given a position of authority in the congregation. Are you a pioneer? Are you a servant? Are you an elder? And if you are given any title, you're always in fear that someone's going to catch you out. Did you say something wrong? Did you act in a way that's not you know, corresponding with the beliefs of your religion? So it trains you to have this kind of paranoia about yourself. When you're a Jehovah's Witness, you go on the ministry to save people's lives. That's the most important thing. That's the bottom line. When you step away from it and you realize that you've been played a fool for 25 years of your life, losing a few family members through disassociating or something like that is a small cost to pay for the voice you need to provide for the ex Jehovah's Witness community. It's, it's a moral obligation. So you don't necessarily say, you know, screw it. You say, let's weigh up the pros and cons. Let's think of the amount of people who you can potentially help along the path to developing a more rational mental belief system and then alongside each other there's no comparison you kind of have to say i'm going for it interesting um i was going to say because that's exactly what if you well if you look at what um richard dawkins did he, he i'm sure he's viewed like 
God, I can't imagine how he's viewed. And he just brushes that off and moves forward with the evidence and knowing that he's doing a service to humanity by continuing to speak out. And yeah, we're going to get into the morals of modern times and ancient times, but I want everyone to stay with us as we consider what we're going to be discussing on these topics. So I'll just, I'll just say to Freddie, yesterday I was in the supermarket and I bumped into someone in uh, they, they're no longer a Jehovah's Witness, but I think they still mentally are. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of gave him a nudge in a friendly way and I said, how's it going, mate? And he said, what are you doing? Don't talk to me like this. And I think it's clear that that word has got out in the local area about the YouTube channel and things like this. So you have to have, if you don't have this shell, this, this personality of, I don't care, it's going to be very difficult. You have to kind of have that self-confidence in yourself to believe what you're doing is right so that no matter how other people treat you, you've got that backbone, you know? Wow, well said. So point two is God is obviously really messed up, <laughs> to put it in basic terms. And can you give us an example? Uh, go ahead and give us an example. I'll follow through with something I think will be uh, relevant to the topic. Yeah, I, th I think a couple of examples to me, it was the killing of the Midianites when God orders to, to kill them all and the Israelites kill every adult male and they take back as possession kind of the women and the children. And then they decide, you know what? No, no, we need to kill all the, the children, all the boys that is, and every woman who has slept with a man, but we're going to keep the virgin girls, the young virgin girls for ourselves. And then obviously over time, they would have been forced against their will, obviously, into a marriage. And, and you could view that as rape. You probably do view that as rape because there is no, not a chance in hell that these women will want to sleep with the people who murdered their brothers, sisters, you know, mothers, fathers, uh, grandparents, things like that. Is that coming from the mind of God? Is that coming from a loving, caring God? The Jesus God of the New Testament who says if someone does something wrong to turn the other cheek? Or is this coming from the minds of a bronze, age, bronze aged civilization who were exacting revenge and were using God as an excuse to do so? Interesting. The, the second point, and, and probably it's obviously less people involved in this. This is just to do with one person. But to me, this was a, a real game changer. Numbers 15, 32 to 36. We find the instance of a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath. What he's picking up sticks for, we don't know. The account doesn't say. Uh, when I was a child, I used to pick up sticks and, and paint the ends of the sticks red, green, blue, and use them as lightsaber jewels with my brother in the house. But ever since you move on from being a child, you don't collect sticks for no reason. You're either going to use them to, to heat your house or you're going to use them to cook food or something like that. So th this man was probably doing something like that. What happens when he gets caught collecting sticks? What well, is took in front of the whole assembly, Moses approaches God and God says, take him outside the city and stone him to death. Again, compare that to the God of the New Testament, the more Jesus Christ figure, where you have the example, which is included in some beliefs about the, the prostitute who says, let the person who has sinned, you know, not sin, throw the first stone. Although that's not included in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, you can clearly tell from what Jesus says that these two, these two beings, Jesus and the God of the Old Testament, are completely unrelated. They're not brothers. They're not father and son. They're, one of them's living in Africa. One of them's living in North America. They've never met each other before. They are so polar opposite. And when I thought in my mind about a man picking up sticks, being taken outside a city, and having his wife and his children potentially watch him being stoned to death, I thought to myself, this is a, a terrible being. We can hold an opinion on a god or a deity, even though it's fictional in our mind, we can say this is a grossly immoral and unjust figure. And that was probably the two examples that stood out to me the most. Interesting. It sounds like God is painted in their image uh, in this in this age, in this time. Hundred um, percent. I want to make a comment on this before I do, though. Zachary, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Hey, Harrison, what would you say to Christians who take a more allegorical interpretation of things like Noah's Ark and thus don't think? things like the, uh, the, uh, these debunk, uh, Christianity, if you will. So Good question, Zachary. I've had literally hundreds to even thousand of people say this exact line regarding my Noah's Ark story. And it's probably best that we come to this when we, when we discuss the topic. So I'll probably okay. put it to one side for now. Zachary, we will get to it, man. Thanks so much for the super chat. Okay. So let me paint a picture. I think it's important. 
Uh, you sounded very Marcion, by the way, uh, the <laughs> idea that Christianity is divorced from the Old Testament. And the example that you gave in John 8 is, of course, coming later. That's something that isn't in the earliest sources that we have of the New Testament. So we can't really paint Jesus as if he's protecting an actual prostitute. That's yeah, a Christian exactly. tradition. And I know some fundamentalist Christians who would even say, I, well, they're not extremely fundamentalist, but they'll say, don't preach from that part because that, that actually was interpolated later. Uh, anyway, imagine God. This is what gets me the worst thing about the morality of the deity of the Old Testament. He's supposed to be a father, and he chose Israel as his offspring, if you will, or his apple of his eye. And imagine, put yourself in a position. He's the parent. When they disobey, they reap repercussions. When they do good, they're supposed to be blessed. But then it's almost like this. The story of Job pops in and it's like, well, look, man, we've been doing really, really good. How come we're getting punished? Well, we have an, we have an excuse for that too. Uh, this is all part of God's plan or something. And it's like, well, we're obeying and the promises of these laws say if we obey, we're supposed to get good. If we disobey, we'll get punished. Imagine you or I is standing in the house every day and I say, guys, to my kids, I have three sons. Clean your rooms on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or just one day a week. I need you to clean the rooms. I need you to do this, this, this. These are your chores. They don't listen. They do it sometimes. They don't do it when I say to do it. Whatever. I'm supposed to discipline them. But this is my discipline. I walk out to the front door, and I see a mob of angry men uh, who are just ready. They're bloodthirsty. I open the door, and I said, hey, guys, listen. Come on. I've got kids in here who aren't listening to me. I need you to slaughter and annihilate them, spill their blood, teach them a real lesson. Now, as a parent, like in reality, what would you think of me? I mean, I am an absolute maniac and a horrible, horrible father figure. God does this over and over according to the narrative of the writers saying, why are we in Babylon? Why are we in Assyria? Why did they conquer us? And they took us as slaves and they took our women. And wh wh why, are this, why is this happening to us? Over and over and over. And it happens over and over. And they think they're going to get vindicated. The book of Daniel is all about the vindication, that God's going to come. He's going to save you. There's going to be a resurrection. But it never happens. And so not only is he this crazy maniac figure, who's supposed to protect his children and, and his, his offspring, his, if you will, apple of his eye, chosen people. He not only doesn't do that, but he also doesn't vindicate anything at the end. So that's, that's the mind blower for me is like, have you read the story? I mean, he put them into Egypt on purpose, according to the story, just so he could get them enslaved so that he could show his power just so he could make them not slaves anymore and free them. Oh, his mind is way above ours, though, Harrison. <laughs> and his thoughts are so much. That doesn't sound like a very nice uh, father. That doesn't sound like a, a good God. That's just my opinion. And we have other examples of other gods that do this. And look, the one who believes in this God is going to look at you and go, you are wrong. You don't understand. But then if you mention that Krishna or Vishnu or any other de deity did something that was absurd, or let's say Zeus, he slept with a human woman. He raped a woman even. Dionysus, whatever. Oh, oh, that's corrupt and immoral and not right. But you're have you read your book? Have you considered it? So that's my thoughts. I really love that illustration of the father and getting that mob to kind of say, here's my child, you know. You always get this, no matter what religion it is, they will defend their God to the hilltops. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that in so many, in so many comments to my videos, you get this kind of thing of we can't question God, we don't know the mind of God. There is always a good reason. It prevents them so much from thinking rationally and developing critical thinking skills. It is just a complete mental barrier. And they so easily do it. As you say, any other thing, they've got the most critical mind. You know, they go out to buy a car. They're looking at everything meticulously like, well, what's the reviews? They rate the stars and all this stuff. But turning their attention to, the own to their own religion and their own God. No, that's, that's not the thing that we should do. Don't go there. Yeah. No. Don't go there. That was strike two. Strike three. Noah's Ark. This came about because my dad was at work with me window cleaning. And he said, I tell you what you should do as your next public talk. There's an outline called the flood of Noah's day has meaning for us. And I thought to myself, wow, this is perfect. Because I did my first public talk called evidence of God in the world around us. It was using uh, evidence to 
encourage the congregation to bolster their faith in God and in the Holy Inspired Bible. And I thought maybe I could do something like this with Noah's Ark. I'll find ample evidence from the Bible and secularly that proves this story is 100% historically true. And everyone will just leave the kingdom all thinking, thank goodness for that talk, because I feel encouraged. I feel like the Bible, I may have had a doubt in it, but I don't have a doubt anymore. So I thought this is a great outline to tackle. I then got home from work and I looked at the outline and I saw there was maybe five or six pieces of evidence. And I started at number one, where it's basically, in other words, said, we know the story's true because the Bible teaches it as historical fact. And obviously to anyone who's heard of the logical fallacy of circular reasoning, you know that you can't use this sort of reasoning. It's the same as a, as a Muslim saying, um, we know that Muhammad was a true prophet because the Quran says so, or a um, Hindu saying, we, law- we know that um, Vishnu or Lord Shivas, I think it was, brought, it, brought his beheaded son back to life because the, the Holy Vidas teaches it as fact. A Christian would never accept those two lines of reasoning. They'd say that's absurd. It's just circular. But again, as we were talking about before, because it's their own book and all of it's inspired, if we have a doubt with one part and the other part verifies that doubt as being true, well, then there we go. It must be true. And so I took on this topic and for a period of months, I annihilated every aspect of it. I looked at woolly mammoths frozen in Siberia and and across the the Canadian uh, area there at the top of North America. Um, I took Chinese picture symbols, with, like the word for flood. It's eight people. It's a boat. Oh, could there be something in that too? I took all these different things that Christians would would kind of scrape the barrel, I suppose, and say and find anything to back up this story as being true. And after analysing all of it, I was left with this kind of feeling of, oh, I'm I'm not sure I could do a public talk on it. You know, it's it's even the strongest evidence is quite weak. I'm not sure I could do it. But then, as I was saying, with regard to reading The God Delusion and things like that, my perspective shift. Mm. I then watched YouTube videos and did online research from people who had questioned this story and had come to a very different conclusion. And it didn't take long before rational thinking meant that within, I'd say you can you can debunk the story of Noah's Ark within 50 se- 15 seconds. Should we give it a go? Go for it. Okay, right. Get the timer out. Count the number of mammals in each continent on Earth. South America has the highest number of mammals. How did they get there if there was no way in the last 4,000 years? Seven seconds. Seven seconds. (laughs) See, (laughs) I I had this debate with my mum today because she's staying with us for a while. My mum said, I wonder what you could debunk quicker, Adam and Eve or Noah's Ark? And I said, well, Adam and Eve, people are going to say about carbon dating. People are going to say, well, no, Adam and Eve weren't literal figures and all this stuff. So I said, mum, take Noah's Ark take the example of the mammals the the only true flying mammal is the bat so how did these thousands of species of fully formed um mammals get to south america how did they get to australia i think even the most ardent christian struggles to defend this story as being fact and so that's when we reached this comment i think it was uh, by a guy named zachary i'm not sure where he said about how would you answer someone who says Noah's Ark is an is a allegorical story. I've had that mentioned a few times and I always say the same thing because these, these sort of Christians, I call them kind of like milky Christians because being a Jehovah's Witness, you take the full Bible as being inspired and infallible. You take the first 11 chapters of the Genesis narrative as historical fact. Yeah, there's a couple of interpretations in there with regards to the Hebrew day being a period of time, but these stories literally happened. So for Christians who say, Let's dismiss Noah's Ark. It, 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 was a, it was a foreshadowing of the church and how it would be protected from the floodwaters of Satan and his system. Let me ask you this. Matthew, I think it's Matthew 1 and Luke 3, where we find a genealogical record of Jesus' ancestors, which include both Noah and I think in Luke 3 we have Adam. If you're going to say that these characters may not have existed or these stories may not have happened, are you going to say, well, Jesus' genealogy is wrong? Are you going to say that when Jesus mentions Noah and the flood, that's also wrong? In Peter, where it says that, is that also wrong? Mm-hmm. What I found from, from my research is that when science disproves something, 
they will straight away say, this is allegorical, allegorical. this is metaphorical, this is figurative language. But when science reinforces a Bible story as actually potentially it could have been true or a battle took place or this, look, this figure in the Old Testament existed because it's carved into this writing in Jerusalem. Yes, it must be true. And we know it's fact. And so with regards to Noah's Ark, the question I have for Christians is who say this story is an allegory, it's metaphorical. If the science proved it was true, would you still be saying that? Or would you be saying it's historical fact? Yeah, I love that. I see that happen all the time. It doesn't just happen with Noah's flood. It happens with Jonah in the New Testament. I mean, the New Testament assumes this Jonah narrative is something that really happened. In fact, that there was a guy who went and preached repentance to Ninevites in the midst of the Assyrian situation. And they were the enemies, of course. They conquered them. They were the winners, the conquerors. And God wants to show mercy on them. So go tell them to repent. This narrative is used in Acts as though it's supposed to be, you know, historical. The also the other interesting thing is, is these people aren't even checking that if Acts is fictional. You know, like it's like, I don't know, there's no critical thinking taking place on their own book. But on Noah, I wanted to make mention on the recent interview I did with Joel Baden. Joel Baden being Dr. Joel Baden, uh, he has revisited the documentary hypothesis and most people who tune in probably don't know what that means, but to put it simply, there are multiple narratives in this story of the Bible, especially the Pentateuch. And it's made up of multiple sources. So it's, it's uh, like the redactors, the people who completed this and put this together were taking from more than one source. So in Noah, in this flood narrative, it rained 40 uh, days but then it also rains 150 days. Which is it? And so what happens is, as you talk about allegorizers, people who aren't allegorizers, well, they probably play a part in this as well, but the, the, the consensus, the majority take this as a historical story. So the allegorizers are kind of like a one percenters on the side. Well, we, we, we still keep our Bible. We're, we're still going to keep our, uh, our religious text, but um, it can mean anything you want it to at this point because you can make it say whatever. It's a ventriloquist dummy, you know, make it say whatever you want, you know, <laughs> and uh, that's exactly what happens all the time. Oh, well, Noah and his how many children did he have? OK, well, you know how many planets there are on, in the heaven? Oh, and also, did you know how many chickens I bought the other day? And like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it becomes almost anything. And oh, yeah. people do that with everything in life because we're pattern seeking creatures. We everything we seek, let's connect it. It all has a connection. It all has meaning and purpose. I'm not trying to knock people that seek meaning and purpose. They have meaning and purpose. I have meaning and purpose. But using critical thought on this stuff, like are we doing parallelomania in our everyday lives? Everything has to mean and connect to something. Hey, maybe that's that's something they want to do. But for the consensus. They say this is literally a historical account. What do they do? Well, it rained for 40 days and then a pause took place and then it rained another, you know, 110 days. So a total of 150 days. They're they're harmonizing. We saw the same problem in the narrative when Joseph was sold uh, from his brothers. They were going to kill him. They threw him in a pit. The pit didn't have any water. I think the Midianites come and then it's the uh, Ishmaelites and then it's or whoever they are. And they're both playing a part in the narrative and it's contradictory. So when you find out there's two stories playing in one, which one's true? They're both contradictory. So even in the Bible itself, when you take a magnifying glass to these, they want to super glue stuff, you know, that doesn't belong together. And it's, <laughs> I can only picture like some ridiculous toy that they put the wrong arm on or something. And they put the wrong leg on to make a certain superhero uh, they put Batman pieces on a Superman action figure or something. Um, that's what they're doing to make it make sense. But that's it's it. contradictory. You should have seen me trying to put together the Noah's Ark video because obviously they're taking it literally. And I'm right. reading two parallel accounts, as you're saying, the same as in Genesis 1 and 2. Did it 40 days, 40 nights? And I'm trying to work out how much how much food in in the weight of hay an adult elephant is going to eat over the voyage of Noah's Ark in its entirety. Is it 40 days? Is it 150 days? Is it 365 days? I thought whatever I go for here, someone's going to complain about it because they'll be reading the other account. Right. I intend to do a video in future about Genesis 1 and, and compare it to Genesis 2 because this is the most obvious form of two parallel accounts running side by side that haven't been intermingled together. 
you know, for anyone who literally takes, anyone watching now who's literally taking the, the first 11 chapters of Genesis as inspired and infallible, get a pen and paper out, make notes on Genesis 1 to Genesis 2.2, 2, and then take Genesis 2.3 into the end of, of the chapter. And write down the personality traits of the God that is in that creation account and then compare it with the other one. Write down the order of creation with, with the order of creation in the other one. And just do a side by side analysis. And very quickly, you'll realize that Moses, there is not a chance that he could have wrote the Pentateuch in its entirety or potentially any of it. Moses, that that authorship has been a big issue. And I think a rabbi pointed this out in like 1500 or something. You know, how did he write his own death into the narrative? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. someone else added that in. And then, you know, this part and that part. And they slowly started to see the problem with this. And then that's when I say the Enlightenment actually started to take place and critical scholarship started to poke and say, let's try to explain this. Uh, a documentary hypothesis came up. And then, of course, uh, there was a supplementary hypothesis. There's a whole thing I don't want to get into right here, right now. But they're just trying to explain why there are problems here. Who is Moses's father-in-law? You know, uh, what mountain of God did he go to get the commandments? Is it Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai? The Pentateuch says both, you know, Genesis one, Genesis two, two different narratives, but they put them together. Whoever the redactor was put them together. We have theories on why, but we don't know with fact. And I thought it was interesting that Noah's destruction and flood connects to Genesis one in a particular form of that narrative. That, I think might play the role as to why God hovers over the face of the waters and such. But to say this is a historical, actual historical account, like this book is writing the actual fact, I think is neglecting the idea that, yeah, floods happen in the ancient world. And in fact, this just might be written or oral tradition being borrowed from other nations. And here we are writing our form of it way late in the game too, not nearly as old as things like the Epic of Gilgamesh and whatnot. So um, did you, did that play a role in your thing? The Epic of Gilgamesh, the Mesopotamian flood myth? hundred percent. I know obviously this is myth, myth vision podcast. You know, this is a, a channel devoted to mythology mm -hmm. and past accounts before the ca accounts we take to be inspired and the original, you know, this is found all over the world in every, in every story. And when you start opening your mind and going beyond the, the landscape that you've been presented in your religion, you find everything, the snake in, in Genesis account, Adam, Eve, the rib, you know, you're you're an obviously an expert on these topics. Not an but expert, it's, but I just know some of it. Yeah. Compared to me, you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> All of it dates to, to civilizations around the Israelite culture. So you've got the Babylonians, the Canaanites, the Egyptians. Take something such as circumcising. Why would God want a creature he created to be perfect in the Garden of Eden? Why would he want them to chop off the tip of their penis? Does that then make them imperfect? Was his design flawed? It only makes sense in the light of cultures around them whose beliefs had kind of impacted the Israelite culture. Thanks for the super chat. I think it's Eon. I don't know if I'm, you told me to leave the D silent last time, I think. Uh, so let me know if I got that right. Woo, more myth vision. Thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. No, you're right. Uh, I'm, I love that uh, Dr. Price mentions that the Genesis creation plays a serious role in the Prometheus narrative. Uh, there's this funny story, uh, if you will, or myth, uh, that Zeus goes and creates mankind. And Prometheus is also a divine uh, you know, god figure. He creates man to do sacrifices to him. And for those of you who say that God is within or outside of time and space, I just wonder why is it that God smells and, and loves the smell of a sacrifice, does he just poke his head into reality and go, let me go into space time for a second. Whoo, you keep cooking, boys, keep cooking. Let me, You know, like, what is this? And Prometheus, his role is to go to the humans who are sacrificing to the gods or to Zeus and pick up the, the, the burnt offering, bring it to Zeus. And of course, uh, there were jars. And so he fills one of them up with guts and his meal is supposed to be guts, and Zeus is supposed to get the filet mignon and the, the back strap and the, the good meat. Well, one day Prometheus switches the jars. He puts the good meat and then a layer of fat on the top so Zeus can't see it. And then in the other one, he fills it with guts and a layer of filet mignon at the top, so to speak. Hands it to Zeus, and Zeus realizes real quick he had been tricked, and he had been uh, lied to, if you will. So he curses Prometheus and mankind. 
that's the Prometheus tell. But in the Epic of Gilgamesh, what I found interesting is here we have somebody looking for eternal life in this plant. He swims to the depths of this water and finally finds it after he goes and discovers where it's at. I'm really shortcutting here. Gets this plant that's supposed to give eternal life, comes up and he's so tired he takes a nap and a snake slithers on by, takes the plant and disappears and eternal life is nowhere to be found. So we have a snake in the narrative. We have the same stuff going on. How do they view those myths? Oh, well, those are just myths. Or uh, that doesn't, that's not historically accurate. Those are copycats of the biblical original. <laughs> yes. And it just becomes silly after a while, you know? Mm. Especially when the, you can analyze the language that was wrote in cuneiform and you can see that this level of cuneiform predates it by about 1,000, 1,500 years to the Israelite text. Historians, scholars in these things are literally laughing at the fact that people are saying that the Genesis narrative came first. But obviously a Christian would never study these topics from, from scholars who question or are skeptical about their holy book because that's not a territory that they'd ever want to go into. I think it's fascinating you talk about this, this being which smells the pleasing aroma of burnt flesh. It's not something that I mentioned really in the Noah's Ark video, but I did, I did want to if it was for the sake of time. Right. You find a being which in Genesis is walking amongst the garden, looking for Adam and Eve. Where, where, where are you? You know, talking to Cain and Abel. What happened to your brother? Where is he? Eventually, as you go from Genesis to Exodus, God moves up a mountain. So he's he's been displaced from the earth. Now he's a mountain. In the, in the Christian Greek scriptures, we have the heavens, you know, the heavens as being just above where we can see, where kind of aeroplanes fly today. And then now, in light of modern day science, yeah. God has been removed from the whole <laughs> universe itself. Well God said. is now outside of time, space, and matter. He can transcend it. He can do backflips in it. He can do front somersault twists and a half pipe turn. He can do whatever he likes outside of time, space, and matter because there must have been a first cause. And that first cause must be immaterial outside of time. And so this mental gymnastics, it, it will never end. They finally landed at a place where probably we as a species can never debunk their claim because we'll never go outside the universe if that even exists. That's really interesting you say that. God keeps getting more sophisticated. Uh, <laughs> and this is true because, well, um, I've got friends now, even my wife, I admittedly say this, my wife um, thinks God is energy and like uh, almost to a point where God now becomes nature, which has been known. The Greeks thought this, you know, 500 BC, there were some Greeks who thought God was nature or whatnot, that there's some divineness to all, all natural uh, reality that we see. Uh, not common, but it was known that that's happened. Anyone who's interested in knowing some of this stuff, uh, read, Ancient scientist in the Roman early Roman Empire by Dr. Richard Carrier, he goes into this and shows you like what different scientists and really they were natural philosophers and such, what they believed and what they thought. But I find it interesting how sophisticated God becomes. And after a while, evolution can be in Christianity, uh, all these concepts. But behind that is this secret, invisible, metaphysical power that's behind it all. And I get why we think something intelligent. Or we look at things and go, wow, why do we exist? Look at the things that we have. But um, there are people who are trying to make these books still tie into that. You want to have a Spinoza God or something? Sure, go for it. But you're using a deity who's punishing his own chosen people time and time and time and time again with little to no vindication according to their own perception and here you have a group that's trying to justify we're jumping into the new testament for one second i gotta say this <laughs> there's a group of people that i became called full preterist i always bring this up because christians say the end isn't it's near it's about to happen but it never happened yet Jesus is still going to come back. He's going to take care of all the bad. He's going to bring in all the good. He's going to destroy evil, blah, blah, blah. The same thing we've been hearing for 2000 years as humans. And there's a group who's trying to vindicate and save this scenario. And they recognize Jesus said it was going to happen soon. Paul said it's about to happen. This stuff is supposed to occur in our lifetimes. Paul says in first Thessalonians, you know, we who will remain and are alive at his coming will be transformed and be taken into heaven and blah, blah, blah. But those who are dead right now are asleep. They'll rise first. And then we who remain in our life. What Christians do is they read that and they go, we, you and me. That's and nice. they don't realize Paul's saying to a group of people in the first century, us, 
you know, when he comes to get us, because it's supposed to happen in this life. This is no different than the cult that had committed suicide in the 80s, thinking Jesus was an outer space alien who's supposed to come by and suck them into heaven. This is not very different from Jehovah's Witnesses claiming he's going to come back in the clouds, but it didn't happen. And mm -hmm. so what full preterists try to do is say it did happen. It was allegorical. He came in the heavens. He used the Roman Empire to do all his bidding. And uh, you have to scratch your head and go, okay, well, since the Old Testament continuously makes promises of good for God's chosen people, what did he do in the New Testament? Well, the Jews get blamed for everything. Uh, the Jews get the punishment. And in fact, look at what the temple, look what happened. They're starving to death and they're cannibalizing their own children within the temple. Read Josephus. The most horrific things you can imagine happen within that temple to try and survive the Roman attack, or if you will, uh, they're trying to really destroy the zealots that are in the temple. And uh, how is this good for Israel? Did God's promise become true to Israel? No, no, no. You know what we'll do? The church said. We are the true Israel. We have faith in Jesus. We're part of the seed of Abraham, Je uh, Galatians 3. So now the church replaces Israel. All that stuff just goes out the window when Christianity comes on the scene. So yeah. it's just, uh, it's so unbelievable when you start looking at all of it. Yeah, what's the saying? Uh, the religion of one age is the literary entertainment of the next age. You know, we look back at other civilizations, uh, N Nordic beliefs, you know, um, Thanos and um, who's the one with the hammer? Thor. Uh, and we laugh at that, but they were sacrificing humans to their gods. You know, they were taking this very seriously. They thought it, these were literal beings. And we look back and laugh and we make Hollywood films about them. Mm. In a few thousand years time, will they be doing that about us? I think we look back and we, we find stages and patterns. I think with regards to your wife and many people out there, which I called on on my ministry, mm -hmm. they say that, I think it was Christopher Hitchens who said Buddhism is for those who have exhausted monotheism. So you've kind of given up on trying to find some truth in Islam or Judaism or Christianity because Buddhism is a far more find your energy, find, you know, the tree, the nature, the cosmos. And it's embracing all these, th all these things and labeling them spiritual. And I think that's a big discernment that Christians or those leaving Christian communities need to, need to find in their minds is that just because you've left a high control group or a religiously devout community, it doesn't mean you're not spiritual. It means that you've left a religion. This, what we describe as being spiritual is, is a sense of awe. It's a sense of wonder. It's a sense of looking up at the universe and thinking, I'm not even a dot. I'm smaller than a dot. I'm, if I was on a whiteboard, you wouldn't even have a dot on it because I'm that small. And in a way, it, 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 it gives you a big, big punch in the gut. It's a reality check going from thinking that you're this God-given creature to being such a small bit of dust. But that doesn't mean that you can't have this awe, this wonder that many Christians claim only they can have when looking out at the outside world. You're absolutely right. There's just uh, more to this when we realized we weren't the center of the universe, when we aren't everything there is. I think then we can have a little humbleness as humans and realize, you know, we have this planet that we have with life on it. We need to take good care of that. So we're not just humanist in the sense that we want to be good to all humans because Look, these religions divide so much that you're not part of my group. Well, you're out there. You're not one of us. Real quick, David Samuel. Thank you for the super chat, my brother. David Samuel is secretly the god of myth vision. And I say that because you don't really see him that often. He peeks his head in every once in a while. And he's behind the uh, computer there making all this stuff work. Uh, I was going to say, why is, he, why is he donated 1914? <laughs> yeah you already know why you yeah, already know why and it's the password awesome. if you ever want to break into a kingdom hall not that i'm encouraging it try the password 1914 <laughs> <laughs> harrison your channel and videos rock so proud of you bro keep up your brilliant work that's awesome man thank you david for the super chat yeah thanks bro. very much david building yeah. on that last discussion derek it's it's fascinating uh what you're saying in in all these regards to mythology and how we look out at the universe I really do think that as time as time proceeds to go on, there will be even more and more Christians who are struggling with regards to finding meaning and purpose. I've had already many people contact me, a, a guy in Brazil who I, I fortunately my sister-in-law is Brazilian, so we could kind of have a three-way Zoom chat and she could be right. the, the kind of translator in that regard. But he was really struggling. He's left Jehovah's Witnesses. And he feels deflated. He feels low. And when you look at, 
again, what we're talking about is things make sense in the light of evolution. When you look at other other primates, when they are giving a, a high status in, in their community, you'll find that the, their serotonin levels in the brain will be very high. And then when, they're, when these primates are removed of their high status, when they're just peasants or when they're serving others, in fact, their status goes and their mentality goes and, and they start releasing more uh, cortisol and things like that, which is like a stress coping mechanism hormone that we produce in our bodies. Now, in two ways, this relates because think of founders of, of Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. Think of the adoration they got, the respect. Think of the modern day governing body mm-hmm. when they get off a plane and they're just warmly welcomed by thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses. They're treated like celebrities now. This um, serotonin in their brain is going wild. And also for not not just the leaders, but people like me and you, Derek, what did we used to think of ourselves? Even if we thought we were the lowest of the low, at the back of our mind in our Christian brain, we're thinking, I'm important to God. I'm a valuable, loved being. I had you know? a, I had an interesting slogan that I had made onto like my desk. It was like a plaque my wife made. I am nothing but a sinner, nothing at all, but Christ is my savior, my all in all. That That's was it. my slogan back in the day. I am nothing but a sinner, nothing at all, but Christ is my savior, my all in all. And you know what? If any Christian listening to this who's really devout listens to that, they will say that's the truth. We're nothing at all. And why would he care so much to save us and die on our behalf? And like they don't even question the story behind. I mean, this is the thing. When you get into like Calvinism like I did and you want to know the predestination, like did God know or did he plan all this to happen? And you read stuff like sneak peeks of it in Revelation. He was the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. It was all planned that he was going to come and die, which means it was all planned that all of this BS and death and and horrible raping and killing and diseases and famine and like all the divide, every little hard thing that's ever happened, all part of it. And it all had to happen. And he puts him in this garden and he says, you see that tree over there? Yeah, that one. Don't eat from that tree over there. You know, that one, which one? Oh, that one. Okay. And I'm just being funny by saying like, he put him in there, like set him up for failure, but Christians want to go right to free will. Oh, it's right to free will. So we can protect our God. We're the ones to blame. And you know, it's no different than the Jews that had real circumstances happen. We have historical evidence that, that Israel and Samaria, the Northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians in the eighth century BC. We have good reason to say that happened for sure. And they were taken captive. Some who were good, like if you were a really good scientist, let's say, you weren't uh, a slave that was out in the field digging trenches and stuff. But if you were just a peasant, you were a slave and it wasn't good for you or your women. I say all that to say, like these real historical things that happened, they kept internalizing, oh, it's our fault. We should have done this. We should have done that. Like, what if we had other explanations instead of this superstitious idea that it's always our fault or we're the reason we didn't keep enough Sabbaths. I told Joe not to pick that stick up on the Sabbath <laughs> and he picked it up. That's why Assyria conquered us and had our women ripped, raped and all this stuff happened. He shouldn't have touched that damn stick. Yeah. This, Th- this sort of mentality pre exists these civilizations. Think of the term scapegoating. You put all the sins and all the guilt of the whole nation onto a goat and you send it off in the desert to die a slow, painful death of dehydration, basically. And you're removing that from yourself. You're easing it in the eyes of yourself and your community. This superstitious nature goes so far back into our DNA. And we're continuing to look for answers where there may be none. You know, think of topics such as consciousness, abiogenesis, which is the um, evolution of matter on Earth from non-living to living uh, chemicals and, and organisms. The universe itself, we may never have answers to these questions, mm-hmm. but there will always be people who claim I have the answer yeah. because the book says so. I'd rather have questions that I cannot answer than answers I cannot question. And I heard Fifth say that. He's an ex-Jehovah's Witness, and he did a song called The Cost of Doing Business. Yeah, great song. It is. And he mentions that in there. I'd rather have questions I can't answer than answers I can't question. I always tell people when someone says they have the answer or they know 
like when it comes to these really deep epistemological questions or foundational presuppositional knowing of things that we don't have evidence for and they say they know turn around you know really take very little what they say seriously because i need something i need i need stronger evidence to really make those type of um claims actually true in my mind so the bible is not a good place i would say to really get your morality from to really trust history from don't get me wrong i love the stories i mean i wouldn't talk about the bible so much on myth vision if i didn't love discussing these things but the way i look at it now versus what i looked at it then and tell me if you relate to this mm. everyone who's watching has heard of david blaine David Blaine is the magician who will literally make you think he has real powers. All right. He's obviously a manipulator in that sense that he's a magician. He's conning you. You think it's real, but it's not. Um, he's just really good. Sleight of hand, et cetera. And we're all sitting in an audience watching this magic show by David Blaine. And it's a pretty good magic trick. Our parents told us when we walked in, this is real magic. Make sure you watch the show. We watched the show and our parents told us this is real magic too. Go check out the show. And their parents told them and on and on and on. So we go in there and we watch the show and we're like, whoa, it looks like it's real. We, I felt an experience from the amazing trick he just did. Chemicals started releasing in the brain, but you don't really know that because you don't experience that. You don't know that serotonin and endorphins and things are happening, causing you to get these experiences. Oh no, mm -hmm. that's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Make sure you know the difference. <laughs> anyway, this guy at the corner over there is like, hey, hey, listen to me, guys. Listen, I want to tell you how this trick happens. No, no, no. The magician doesn't want you to do that. They don't want you to know. The people who are telling you go in there. It's true. Don't listen to anyone who tells you otherwise. And we peek behind the curtain. We finally got to see he's steady, setting up his, his tricks. And we see it. Now we want to run back out in the audience and say, hey, 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 check it out. I have like you guys are over here dividing yourselves from the rest of humanity because you think you have the correct truth and you're now splitting yourself. I'm here to tell you that what you're saying is actually historically accurate and true is a trick. It's not actually what you think it is. And who knows if the original authors who wrote some of this stuff actually thought it is the way you are thinking of it. I mean, who knows? So we want to tell them, but what happens? We get shunned. We get we get put on the outskirts. We get disciplined. Because we're seeing things that don't make sense. But nope, the God-given brain that you were given is all deceived. Satan has that much power. He has so much power, Harrison. He's got you tricked. That's what they'll make you want to believe. They have to say that. They can't, they can't have any other explanation for why you are where you are today and believing what you believe. Hmm, that's such a good illustration. I love that. It is a big con. It's a big magic trick. But you try telling someone. It's like someone in a cult. They're in a cult, but you try telling someone in, they're in a cult. When I told my dad he was, and I listed an email of 10 things that all cults have in common, the next day I was no longer his WhatsApp picture. It was a picture of this random thing. You know, that's how quick the conditional love stops when you tell them straight what they're involved. People do not like that at all. So you go and say it's a magic trick. They're going to say, Satan's got a hold of your mind, mate. I think for me, probably the best there's a couple of films which I really relate to, and I've told you about these, The Matrix and The Truman Show. I think The Truman Show, if you haven't seen it, by the way, of anyone mm. watching, you watch it tonight. You know, grab yourself a takeaway and watch it. Epic film. But here's a man living inside a dome, basically. And he has no reason to ever question that his reality is not reality. He's got a wife. He's got friends. He's got neighbours. He's got a job. And he just goes about his day. He's happy. He, in the morning, he says, good morning. If I don't see you again, good afternoon, good evening and good night. And he goes away with a smile on his face. He's living his life. And just like me when I was a Jehovah's Witness, say a prayer, go on the ministry, meet up for a coffee break. You get into this routine. But all it took was one thing for Truman to start questioning things. And then he was examining everything in this dome. His wife says, do you want some of this product? You know, use it on your toast or whatever. And he says, why are you talking like this? And she was doing an advertisement for The Truman Show, which is the TV show that he's the main character of. And in many ways, you can find parallels here because when you're waking up from Jehovah's Witness indoctrination, you feel like you are the main character of a Hollywood blockbuster. Your whole life has been a lie. You were born into a matrix and you're now starting to wake up. And it drives you mentally to the limits. 
It pushed Truman to get into that boat, that yacht or whatever it was, and eventually hit the outside of the dome. And then he's confronted with reality. And it's an emotionally breaking down experience. You know, he struggles to cope with it, but he does and he leaves. And in so many ways that parallels our experience, Derek, of, of kind of breaking the barriers down of our belief system rationally, hopefully. And then having the having the ability, the confidence and the courage to say, it's time I need to leave and potentially highlight to other people what's really going on inside that dome. Absolutely. I think it's the systems, the systems that are attaching themselves to these these stories and these narratives that are causing so much harm. You know, if we could read the Bible the way we read uh, Greek epics or something else in modern times, I think the harm could go away. And I'd still see fascination in these books. I still love reading this material. I just uh, don't like it being used as your rule book. And it's still being done today in this in the time and age we live in now. I've got Christians who are liberal that are more like they they see the problems like they literally see contradictions like the Gospels, the synoptics. There are contradictions. There are Christians who recognize this. And I'm not talking about basic Christians, PhD candidates at Duke University right now that know what they're looking at. And they'll say, yeah, there's problems. They still have faith. It's it's their subjective approach. They want to believe in something. They say, I like the morales of Christians and self-sacrifice and whatnot. So they want to remain a Christian. But they recognize it's not inerrant. It's not infallible. This stuff has problems. It's not 100% accurate. They don't follow everything it says and that it has meaning for us right now today. They recognize what it is for what it is. And then boom, they still live in today. They allow society's structure of morality to be what they follow. And as we talked about God earlier and me being a parent, imagine if I let a mob come in and slaughter my kids because they were disobedient. And when I say disobedient, I don't mean one of my kids is like trying to murder the other kid necessarily. I'm talking, why are you talking back to your father? Or why are you um, not obeying me? You, you, Why are you sleeping with that girl before you got married or whatever it might be? I'm just giving you an example. Like, like you're going to kill him because in his own human nature, he wants, it, he's attracted to whether it, it's opposite sex or same sex or whatever. He's attracted naturally to that. Oh, let's, blame him let's 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 punish him for something that comes natural i it's also the same failure i see for priests and monks and such that put themselves in these vows for celibacy their whole life when their in their natural inclination is sexually drawn to you know want to do those things and um next thing you know they're over here putting themselves in a situation where they're molesting a child or they're doing something like unbelievably horrible because the religious restraints that have, Hey, you, you must vow for the rest of your life. You must never do this as if sex is a bad thing. Why Paul, Paul says not to do it. Don't get married, mm -hmm. you know, and unless you burn with lust. So, well, the Christians go, those priests were wrong because they were burning with lust and they knew they should have married then. And they're already in a vow and a system that says, don't, you can't marry, don't do it. So there's so much wrong with so many of these things, if that makes sense. Oh, it does completely. I think I can touch on one point you're talking about, which is how the societal normalities that we find ourselves living within are bearing heavily on all these religious organisations. I think you take Jehovah's Witnesses, um, Jeffrey Jackson at the Royal Commission in Australia, who was interviewed and asked about punishment for children, corporal punishment, and smacking your kids. Now, every Jehovah's Witness before 10 years ago kind of knew that you smack your kids. The Bible teaches in Proverbs, uh, the words of apparently Solomon about the rod of reproof. Everyone knows you smack your kid to make him behave. Well, not in modern society, I'm afraid. You know, there's other disciplines. Watch Super Nanny USA or something like that. There's a naughty step, you know, <laughs> tell your kid to spend five minutes on the naughty step. It can be an effective treatment. It will be an effective treatment. Find something that works outside of smacking your child. And so when Jeffrey Jackson was asked this, he, he knew, you could see his face. He knew that the Bible teaches to smack your kid. However, because he would get in trouble financially for the organization, and there'd be a whole load of lawsuits, most likely, if they said, no, we still want to smack our kids. He had to say, uh, no, it, it can be interpreted as, as uh, any form of discipline. And so they've changed that in the Bible now, a footnote to mean any form of discipline. And you see this whole clinging on to what the Bible says, but it will always be interpreted in the, in the generation in which we're living in. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. As you said earlier in the show, we always think think, uh, the Bible is talking to us as an individual. Me and you now, Jesus is coming any day now, Derek. We've done so hard for our entire lives. Come on, man, we can make it one more day to Armageddon. Right. Not knowing that in 200 years time, when the Jehovah's Witnesses are about 4 million, because they'd have crashed probably due to the internet keeping on going, those 4 million or so Jehovah's Witnesses will be saying the same thing. They'll be saying, you know what? I'm 12th generation Jehovah's Witness. We need to hold on. Armageddon is coming tomorrow. <sighs> it's painful. To, it's painful to say that though, you know? It never ends. I mean, this stuff started in like books of Daniel, for example, where the 69th week, week, we got one week to go and it's going to happen. It didn't happen. Now the Christians are using this same narrative. They're borrowing from like Daniel and its concepts of the end happening soon. And next thing you know, Christians are still doing this today. I've seen some highly sophisticated, elaborate videos that actually try to say, okay, uh, Donald Trump and the number for the barcode and the, you know, they, they come up with the most interesting, strange patterns that they find in modern times. And they go, this is evidence. This is evidence that it's about to happen now. I mean, this isn't even in the Jehovah's Witnesses. These are just fundamentalist Christians. And so, yeah, I'm with you 100%. And it goes right back to uh, the idea of everything gets changed. Now Christianity started to borrow evolution. Remember when that was going on in courts in the early 1900s and they were arguing saying evolution's a lie from Satan and this and this and that. Now you got William Lane Craig and popular apologist of the Christian church saying evolution's true, but uh, there's intelligent design pushing evolution to happen. Uh, you know, th there's always a, let's make God get further and further and more sophisticated to a point where there's no evidence that he exists in terms of you can't physically prove it, you can't show it, but he's the thing behind all reality that we see and keeps it sustained and such. So now there's no way to ever find him or prove that he's true. But when you go back to the book, God appears and comes down in clouds over, you know, appearing to certain men in the clouds. He comes down to the tabernacle or to the temple where God ends up appearing, uh, showing his back parts to Moses or God's son decides he's going to resurrect and then appear to Thomas, doubting Thomas. All you got to do is just have faith because it says, blessed are those who don't see. You're never going to, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, don't see and still believe because the, those are the blessed ones. Just even though you don't see but, it, believe it. But you want to see it. I mean, one thing yeah. I didn't mention in my interview with Lloyd Evans was the fact that, um, I suppose if you haven't seen that interview, um, when the circuit overseer, who's kind of the Apostle Paul of the Jehovah's Witness community, who travels between congregations and encourages you, he kind of knew from my elders that I was fading and my and I was eventually going to leave the organization. They could they could see the writing was on the wall. They offered me what I dubbed a six month miracle. So the circuit overseer said, for six months, I want you to pray every day for God to reveal himself. And I also want you to only listen, read and watch Jehovah's Witness publications, videos on questions to do with God, religion, Just brain, the Bible. brainwash yourself for six months with the <laughs> only one thing. And then, yeah. Yeah, completely reindoctrinate yourself. I, I said yes. After about a week, I said yes. I didn't want to, but I thought, well, at least it will please my dad because my dad will not be able to say, well, you didn't give God a chance, has. The next day he sent me an email and the email was an old Watchtower Awake article entitled Why Certain Miracles No Longer Occur. And so I was going to pray for six months for God to reveal himself, even though the elders are telling me that certain miracles no longer occur. And by certain miracles, they mean any miracle. Yeah. Basically, what they wanted me to do was reopen the Bible at any random page, read something. And think, wow, that's powerful. That's God talking to me directly. And yeah, that's what some Jehovah's Witnesses do. They just go like that and they close their eyes and they go, oh, okay, well, that, that talks to me. The problem with that obviously being that you can open a Harry Potter book and you could read a line and interpret it in a way in which you think, wow, that's relating to the fact that my sister has had an issue in her marriage. And if I don't apply that in that context, God's answered that prayer straight away. I thought to myself, how come Saul gets this amazing miracle on the road to Damascus where he's blinded by this light and he gets talked to by Jesus and I'm not allowed anything. And they're in fact telling me, they're putting kind of handcuffs on God so that he can't act in my life. They're saying God's powerful, he's all powerful, he created the universe, but he's not going to step in and click his fingers for you. 
And I think that perfectly sums it up. They believe God exists. Mm -hmm. They believe he's all powerful and that he will step in. But in terms of any actual evidence that goes beyond hearsay, they know that's not going to happen. And so again, we have this cognitive dissonance. Miracles happened. Why can't they happen? Well, because there's no need to. The book is full. The Bible's all we need. That is the biggest miracle. And that's the same in Islam. You hear this often uh, on street preaching and things like that. When when a Muslim is asked, where's a certain miracle? They'll say, the greatest miracle of Muhammad, the works of the Quran. It's common to all religion. Just basically taking a step back and saying, this holy book is the miracle that you need. Digest it. Mm. Look, look, I got my good friend here trying to troll us. Josh, <laughs> I actually go to see him next month, but uh, he, he's he's playing a presuppositional thing. He's <laughs> he's, he's he's trying to kind of do a dark uh, Darth Dawkins type thing. Love you, man. Thanks for uh, checking us out here, too. So we're rolling right now with 425 people watching. Um, I wanted to say in light of uh, what you just were talking about in particular, um, one of the things that you actually said that was resonated with me was how they say the miracles stopped happening back then. Yet there's some people who want to go, well, it happens. Have you ever prayed and something happened? Like, God, I hope I can pay my bills this Friday. You go put your ass to work all week and you do all this hard work. And next thing you know, you get paid and you got enough to pay your bills all of a sudden. Or you ask people if they can help you, but they can't right now. And the next thing you know, by Friday, they have enough money. And they, oh, I knew a miracle would happen. And it's like, bro. Like, why are you saying that's a miracle? Like, I just don't get it. You're optimistic, cool. You jump and do the God of the gaps thing in your head and assume that was a miracle. But like the miracle defined that you see in the Bible, a guy doesn't even have an arm. And Jesus says, stretch forth thine arm. Oh, what the, where did that arm come from? Okay. If that happened like whew, all day, like I don't think we'd even have a, I wouldn't even have a, a YouTube channel. In fact, I might, but it would be against all these other myths out there that aren't true, and the Christian one is true. If that kind of stuff happened, then sure. But this whole thing was brainwash on their part, and they know that repetition and the emotions and the families that they'll use against you because they're part of this, it's a corrupt, internal, high-control cult. And it's horrible what they were trying to do. They don't even realize it. That's the sad part. I'm not trying to put the blame and responsibility on the guys that are also duped because they sincerely think they're correct. But I want anyone who's watching this to go, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't Christians, because this is what the claim from Christians. Usually Christians will say Jehovah's Witnesses aren't Christians, Mormons aren't Christians. But then when you go to a Christian and ask who's a Christian, that also depends. Uh, ask a Protestant, well, Catholics aren't Christians. Ask a Catholic, well, they're not really part of the mother church, depending on the Catholic you ask. So I don't want to really you know, hear who is and who isn't, you guys are trying to follow a book. You're trying to believe in this superstition and you guys think it's true. So, you know, that line of orthodoxy that gets painted on what is a Christian and isn't, it's, it's a gray area, man. It's all subjective. Who wants to say who's the true Christian and who's not? I found it all to be subjective, isn't it? Jehovah's Witness hold themselves as separate to what they call Babylon the Great. So if you've been a part of any Christian denomination of the about 40,000 in the world, you were the worldly, satanic Babylon the Great. My latest video, Five Reasons I Left Christianity According to My Family, so many people commenting saying, you left Jehovah's Witnesses, not Christianity. Get it right, basically. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, how do you define Christianity? You could say, well, it's hellfire, it's the Trinity, it's, it's these certain tick boxes. But Jehovah's Witnesses had their tick boxes of what makes Christianity Christianity, why they're true Christians. I think for me... If at any point in your life you thought you were a true follower of Christ and God, that's good enough for me. I can right. I can say you were a Christian. I don't need to know all the specific beliefs that you have. It's not important. What's important is that you analyze these beliefs. We can as soon as you leave one, you can branch them all under the topic of irrational, unfortunately. It's kind of funny. This is a really good point Gregory has. Jesus Christ, or Jesus called the Christ, <laughs> was not a Christian. So, <laughs> so you Christians, uh, your Lord was not a Christian, but I get what the whole point is. It's I really like that. Yeah, it's following uh, the Christian, uh, following the Christ, which they call Jesus. Uh, yeah, this this whole thing, man, is so interesting. 
there's so many topics I can't wait to do with you because your channel is just starting out. I want everyone watching in the description of this video, go and subscribe to Harrison's YouTube channel. He's got really, really well thought out videos and you're going to continue to do this. I actually, I just got a word from the Lord. I just got What's a word saying? from the Lord. He says, you're going to be successful at doing it. <laughs> in fact, you're going to make more videos in the near future. And I suspect they will disclose more information on the truth about all of these uh, myths that we find within the Bible and the Jehovah's Witness cult. Wow. That just came out of nowhere. That was amazing. I, you guys witnessed I, that. Well, that, that might have been a delayed response from God to the six month miracle that I was praying for initially. So better See? late than never, God, you know. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Whoever told you that. Uh, no, in all, serious, in all seriousness, Derek, it's um, it's something which to me, like yourself, it's an area which we are very passionate about. For 25 years, I went door to door, as I said, knocking people's doors, preaching because I felt I felt like it was the right thing to do on my Christian conscience. And now there can be no greater joy than helping people to awaken from indoctrination, to question things and to then prevent the generational indoctrination of their children and so their children don't grow up and leave the faith and then have to be shunned by their dad and their parents in the same way I have. To have these experiences which lead many people to anxiety, depression and even suicide. So this is a topic and a work that, that activists do in which you are hopefully saving lives. And so, yeah, of course, I want to do it as long as possible. Well, you did a fantastic job. I mean, in those videos, you're flood or how did you title it the, the noah one i think it was um noah's ark the story that disproves the entire bible and i think what's fascinating about that and why it's relevant to the new testament the new testament acts like the story of noah is true yeah. so you want to you want to have a, a jenga effect as you show the jenga tower in there and you pull the block that's the foundation of this whole thing you know disproving noah and the flood and showing how this isn't historically accurate the historicity of it, it collapses Christianity. And if the Muslim faith uses this narrative, yeah. it collapses that. And anyone else who wants to build their narrative off of it, you're just more and more. It's almost like I wouldn't expect the New Testament authors to know that Noah's story wasn't accurate. I mean, we're talking hundreds of years at least before it was written uh, from the time of whoever documented or wrote the story of Noah. So I don't expect them to know this. At the same time, when you can look back and see the problems, what do you do? You know, so it shows me it's it's really interesting, man. And that was the story. As I said at the start, did Peter walk on water? Did this miracle happen? Did that miracle happen? Christians will say, well, we take it on faith, just like you take this and that on faith. What I say is Noah's Ark, if you're interpreting the story as being literal, it cannot be taken on faith because if it happened 4,000 years ago and it was a global flood, there will be very, very, very much a lot of evidence to support it. And unfortunately, there isn't any. Yeah, I'm, dude, there's there's so much. And if you do try to get a historical event of some sort, it was a minor local flood, nothing that great. Like, why is the rainbow popping up? You know, what the, <laughs> <laughs> like, what's going on with the rainbow, bro? And getting to the allegorizers, I like to call them the allegorizers because we talked about this earlier, mm. who want to say, Look, if it didn't historically happen, it is it's an allegory speaking the metaphoric truths of the universe and such. Um, some of them want to say the bow, the rainbow is actually a bow, which is an, uh, a zodi or zodiacal symbol, a celestial sign in the heavens. And so it's a Milky Way flood, not an Earth flood that happened here on Earth. It happened in the Milky Way and it didn't actually happen here. There's always a way to escape the reality of what they probably believed about these narratives. The same thing happens with full preterist that I talk about Adam and Eve, when they got kicked out of the garden and they died that day, God says, if you eat, you'll surely die. And then he won't, the serpent says he won't, you won't die. You know, you'll just be like, God, your eyes will open. Think about that for a second. Did they die that day? Well, some people say God lied. Okay. They'll say he died. He died that day. No, they didn't die. It's a lie. The other people will say he began to die that day and eventually death is physical well there's a group that wants to say death is a covenantal allegory it's not literal physical death and that escapes so many problems with their entire premise that we've been discussing from carnivores and death and you name it 
that's what they want to do. They want to make it the smarter and more sophisticated we get and jab critically at the Bible, the more sophisticated they want to change the original context to make it something they can still hold on to. It'll be 10,000 it. years and they'll be like, you see this block of stone that's been <laughs> chiseled? And we're all like able to telepathically send things through our brains to one another. And they're still like, there was this caveman a long time ago who had the truth. I'm just being silly. <laughs> no, it's because times are changing. Honestly, I think in within a few generations, we might see a release of this sort of thing because take a, take a TV show such as The Simpsons. It's been running about 25 years. When it first started, Homer was in church sleeping every Sunday. In every episode, there was church. Now, they almost take the mick out of Christianity and they are far more atheistic. A lot of people are, cl are removing themselves from all these clearly uh, um, fallacious stories because they know they're not true, but they need to cling on to something, whether it be just for their older relatives, their family. They can't begin to mentally imagine the pain that would be caused if they said, I'm an atheist. Mm -hmm. And that word carries such a huge weight in their mind. The words atheist, apostate, things like that. But deep down, if they're non-religious and they've left mentally, then their children and their children's children will grow up in a completely different society. So I think this kind of escaping from the literal nature of the text that they have to interpret in their religion will be something of the past within a few generations. You never I hope know. so. Yeah, because there's a huge stronghold here in, Nor in, in North America. Very fundamentalist Christianity is, it's like a big feel-good Christianity. It's an emotional, you know, they got concerts at church and it's a, um, positive thinking type of message in a lot of these churches. And it just, uh, it keeps evolving. It just evolves with society. And I'm okay with that. Look, I'm more critical of it. Like I want to know what it really said originally. It's fine. If you want to run it through a washer machine 20 times and finally you have this shirt that's shrunk and it's not what it really looked like originally and whatnot, that's cool. You still want to put it on, go for it. I'm not knocking it. Um, but it needs to evolve. If you're still trying to perform middle age uh, morals uh, down here in the 21st century, you're you're behind the learning curve. And another problem we have, I've said this and I'll say it again, call me a prophet. In a thousand years from now, we'll know enough scientifically, as long as we don't blow ourselves up and do something crazy, we'll know enough about our anatomy and how we are as humans that we will look back to this time when we're throwing people in prison and having them serve time in 23 and one or 24 hours a day, seven days a week, locked in a box behind bars. And we'll realize how caveman that is. Am I saying people shouldn't be punished? No, but we'll know things. We'll know how to rehabilitate addicts, for example, who are struggling with addiction and not go a demon or a spirit got a hold of them, or you lack faith. And that's the reason why you're struggling with this physical addiction to a substance or gambling, which isn't a substance necessarily, but the chemicals in the mind. We'll know how to deal with these things scientifically and stop criminalizing our brothers and our sisters, our mothers and our aunts and our cousins. We'll stop doing that. And we'll look back and go, we were still Neanderthals in the 21st century. So that's why I also think morality evolves and it's subjective with the society of, of humans. I know that my friend, um, my friend T jump disagrees. He thinks there's objective morality, uh, to some degree, but I think that they're, it's subjective in many respects. So 100% agree with you there. there. It feels like a level of objective morality, but what do you put that down to? If you didn't teach your children about certain rules, regulations, what's right and wrong, if they were brought up in a completely different culture where it's okay to, I mean, I've heard of tribes in the Amazon and, uh, and things like that, where historically, because they're con continuously traveling, the oldest of the group, they get the youngest behind and they just whack them over the head because they're slowing it down. It's a pain, painless process. They probably wouldn't question it because they've been told it's the right thing to do for the group. But to us, killing your grandma by beating her over the head with a stick, that's just barbaric. It's subjective. If you can be placed in a different environment in a different period of time, maybe you think it's right to burn a witch at the stake. Hmm. It's all subjective, but it does feel objective because of multiple factors for sure. I agree, man. There's just so <laughs> many things that it's, we could go on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I mean, Harrison Cother. 
hope I said that right. Everyone else yeah. gets it wrong. So do I get eternal life for saying it right? Or <laughs> if I could grant it, you would be there on my right, uh, uh, right at uh, my right hand. Hey, look, my good friend Goon says you've not met my grand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Everyone hit that like button on the way out. Those who don't like me or what I had to say today, uh, that's fine. You have a freedom of speech as far as I'm concerned. Uh, go share what you think is true out there. That's fine. And uh, I'm going to continue researching and being critical of what I was taught and um, you know, exploring mythologies and trying to say, what the heck is going on in here? How do you have Midianites and Ishmaelites or whoever they were in the story of Joseph selling him to Egypt? But then they, it, it, there's so many contradictions. So I love poking because I saw behind the curtain. Exactly. And for those who haven't seen behind the curtain, I don't blame you for thinking I am an apostate, horrible reprobate. I don't blame you for thinking that way. I just don't because your book teaches you to think that way. Now you know why I'm going after your book. So there you have it because that book was my book and your faith was my faith. But I was never really a believer. Ask a Calvinist, you know, unless you pers persevere to the end, you're not really ever re uh, regenerate. You never had it. And I could tell you what, man, they could say whatever they want, but I know how sincere I was when I delved into this. And I doubt they had half the sincerity and the drive and the passion to try and come to the truth as I did. But hey, that's subjective too. So what can I say? Any final words from you, Harrison? No, I'd just like to say your channel's absolutely fantastic. Over the last few weeks, I have been binge watching some of your content and it really opens your mind up to myths, Bible scholars. You get some absolutely great guests on the show. So I want to say well done for the work that you're doing on the channel here. And most importantly, thank you so much for having me on as a guest. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to make sure that some of those scholars get in contact with you. Ladies and gentlemen, we got so much coming up. I'm going to be, hopefully, there's a GoFundMe out there, flying to Dr. Richard Carrier. And there's a special thing I haven't told you guys yet, since there's 386 people watching approximately. Dr. Carrier isn't the only person in California that I'll get to meet. If we make that GoFundMe happen, Dr. Dennis R. McDonald will also be there. And he has a cabin that I can stay at where we can record. So I'm not only going to have Dr. Carrier. If you guys can help make that GoFundMe happen, I'll have Dr. Dennis R. McDonald. And he's the guy who's in the Homeric epics and all the good stuff showing how that runs into the New Testament. Hit that like button. Subscribe to his channel, please. If anything, even if you got to skip my channel, go subscribe <laughs> to his because you really, man, you really got a, a special gift is communicating these things and articulating yourself so well. So I hope you keep doing what you're doing, bro. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And in case everyone forgets, and it happens because, you know, we, we've been talking about cognitive dissonance today. We are myth vision. Despite growing up with a picture of Noah's Ark on my bedroom wall, I would go 25 years of my life without ever studying the story's historicity. That was until one particular day, when my dad recommended that for my next public talk, I take a look at the outline, The Flood of Noah's Day Has Meaning For Us. In 2018, as a ministerial servant, I would stand on the platform and try my utmost in public talks to convince the audience that the God Jehovah existed. Six months ago, I was in the kitchen preparing dinner when I overheard the voice of one of the elders in my congregation on the Zoom meeting. He said, you are under attack. 